So these are the lungs. They are vital organs in tetrapods, which is anything with four limbs and a spine, as well as some fish and some snails. In humans, they go about here, and they allow the body to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide, uh, which is what we call respiration. Unfortunately though, quite a lot can go wrong with lungs and stop them from working, including cystic fibrosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, primary pulmonary hypertension, and a whole bunch of other things that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. So we do have all sorts of ways of treating most of these problems, uh, but sometimes a pair of lungs will get to the point where they simply will not work. Uh, so humans, being the fairly remarkable sons of monkeys that we are, have worked out a way to actually pull out old dysfunctional lungs and replace them with new working lungs from someone who doesn't need them, uh, which is someone who isn't breathing, which is someone who is dead. So anyway, we open up the organ recipient, stick in the new lungs, connect up the tubes, and off they go breathing like a champion for the rest of their merry lives. Well, that's the idea. The reality, as usual, is far more complicated and depressing. Only about half of all lung transplant patients survive for five years after the operation, and about a third last ten years. The main reason for this is the response of the immune system, which tends to reject the new lungs and try and destroy them. This is called transplant rejection. So let's zoom in a little. Human cells, in fact the cells of all vertebrates, have what's called major histocompatibility complex molecules in their cell membranes. These molecules identify a cell as being self or non-self. The immune system, being a xenophobic bastard, attacks all non-self material. This works pretty well most of the time, but of course, when someone else's lungs are put in someone's body, the MHC shows it to be foreign, so the immune system, notably the T-cells, do their job and do their very best to destroy it. Ferguson. Now, having your own body try to destroy your lungs from the inside is, um, not good. If it gets really bad, it's called chronic rejection, which, in the case of lungs, manifests itself as bronchiolitis obliterans, which is exactly as pleasant as it sounds. Basically, the little bronchioles of the lungs get damaged and filled up with scar tissue and inflammation, eventually leading to a lot of coughing and death. So, um, we, we don't want that. And there are a few ways which we clever meatbags have actually managed to reduce transplant rejection. Now, variation in the MHC, the molecule that identifies cells as self or non-self, can be examined before a transplant takes place. So when looking for an appropriate donor organ, we try and find one with very similar MHC to the recipient. There are actually global databases of donor and recipient information to aid in finding the best match. So, a good match is a little like a fake ID. With a bit of luck, the organ recipient's immune system won't notice a difference in MHC, and it won't attack the transplanted organ. The immune system is pretty hard to trick though, and it usually catches on eventually, so we have to do something pretty drastic, and actually reduce the function of the immune system. This is achieved through the use of immunosuppressant drugs. There's a myriad of such drugs available, and treatment after a lung transplant usually involves a cocktail of them, which are used for the rest of the patient's life. One of the major ones is cyclosporin, which incidentally was discovered by Norwegians in a fungus called Tulipdecladum inflatum. Um, so cyclosporum is specifically aimed via a barely comprehensible chain of reactions at T-cells, uh, which are one of the main players in transplant rejection. Uh, it, it basically stops them from working properly, thus protecting the donated lungs. Immunosuppressant drugs, though, are pretty fiddly and dangerous, because if the immune system is impaired, the body becomes suddenly vulnerable to infection and other threats that would normally not be a big deal. So it's about finding a balance between these risks. So, by first minimizing MHC differences, then using a regimen of immunosuppressant drugs, we can do a pretty good job of keeping transplanted lungs working in the recipient's body. As stated before, though, lung transplants are really a temporary treatment, as very few people last more than 10 years with uh, transplanted lungs before bronchiolitis obliterans or some other complication takes hold and the patient dies. But if a lung transplant can give someone a few more years of breathing, it's probably not a bad thing. On a related note, it would be really rather good if everyone signed up as an organ donor. Australia has one of the lowest donation rates in the developed world, even though the success rate of the transplants that do happen is one of the best in the world. 1,001 Australians received donated organs last year, but there are still about 1,600 people waiting. To sign up, go to donatelife.gov.au, because you really don't need your organs once you're dead, no matter what the ancient Egyptians believed. Um, so, lung transplants. Pretty good, pretty interesting. I hope you found this video informative and watchable. You can find the references and whatnot in the text below. Thanks.